the Joyful Noise Radio Hour. And welcome to the Joyful Noise Radio Hour. In this episode, you'll be hearing new music from The Ophelias, Daniel Paquette, Mike Adams at His Honest Weight, and Kishibashi. And in about 20 minutes, from your perspective, I will be speaking with Christian from L1011. We will discuss his origin story of sorts, we'll play some of his music, and for all you gearheads out there, yes, we will have a look at his pedal board. But first up, I would like to play you this brand new song from The Ophelias featuring Julian Baker. This track comes from the upcoming Ophelia's album called Crocus, which was just announced this past week. This is the first single from the record, and it is called Neil Young on High. Next up, we are going to dip into the archives a bit with a Kishibashi song called I Am the Antichrist to You. We originally released this song way back in 2012, but the reason I'm playing it for you today is because it's just been featured in a new episode of the show Rick and Morty, which I am excited about because that's one of my favorite shows. I haven't seen the episode yet, but they did send over the script, and I must say I was rather surprised that they chose this song to accompany the show. This is one of the more dark and foreboding songs on the record. But check out this song, which will be immediately followed by Mike Adams at His Honest Weight. Thank you. 
lucid lovers, me and you. A deal of matchless value. I was always quick to admit defeat. Empty statements of bones and meat. And my heart shook.
just heard the first track from the debut album from Mike Adams at His Honest Weight. That came out 10 years ago, originally on the amazing but unfortunately defunct label called St. Ives, which was a little boutique label run by Secretly Canadian, in which they would press essentially 500 copies of bulk vinyl and then rely on the band to make their own artwork for each copy. It was a great concept. I don't know why they stopped doing it. But only 500 copies of this thing ever existed on vinyl, and we are changing that. Joyful Moves will be releasing a 10th anniversary edition of this seminal record very soon. So keep your ears peeled. And lastly, before my interview with Christian from L1011, I would like to tell you about our latest edition of the Gray Area Cassette series from the artist Daniel Paquette. This one's near and dear to my heart. So much so that I actually wrote a, uh, I guess you could call it an article on the Joyful Noise site about this. And rather than trying to feign spontaneity on this podcast, I think I would rather just read the entire article. If that's too boring for you, skip ahead a few minutes. Here we go. The first local rock show I ever saw occurred in 1998 at an all-ages hole-in-the-wall on the north side of Indianapolis called The Music Box. I was 14 years old, awkward as fuck, and completely unprepared for what I saw next. When I walked in, I found about 10 people in the audience and three people on stage in a band calling themselves Ape. The singer was a seven-foot-tall giant who was performing a song that described in graphic detail the entire process of conception through parturition, narrating the journey of individual sperm through the fallopian tubes while his band blasted a wandering, sloppy punk rock soundtrack behind him. That song lasted about 10 or 15 minutes, and it was completely transformative to me. Years later, I discovered that frontman for Ape was named Daniel Paquette. We would become friends, roommates at the legendary Secret Location show house in Indianapolis, and we would eventually create a band together along with our mutual friend Clinton Huey called Abner Trio. Later, Daniel would also become a trusted employee in the early days of Joyful Noise, taking on the unofficial role of our non-theistic spiritual guru. Over the years, and on multiple levels, Daniel has helped guide the label into what it is today. My very intuitive friend Thomas Kennedy once described Daniel as an Old Testament prophet, and 20 years later, I think that description still holds true. Along with being a staple of the Indianapolis music scene, Daniel is one of the most unique people I've ever had the pleasure of meeting. He is the kind of artist who simply does not see the world the same way that most of us do. And when you cross his path, even for a brief moment, it can influence you in profound ways. Unlike most unsung heroes, Daniel does not have that perfect record that everyone must hear. For Daniel, it's not about a perfect composition. It's about a communal experience. Over the years, he created so many random CDRs and demo cassettes, I think even he has lost count. Just about every time I would see Daniel, he would have some new CDR he would be freely giving away. It's impossible to really decipher what is or is not a proper Daniel Paquette record. But why should there be a proper Daniel album? That's just not how Daniel thinks about things. He creates, spreads it around his local community, and moves on. For this collection, I assisted Daniel in whittling down his vast catalog into a 40-minute album spanning 11 years. Though this is a great collection of some incredible songs, the truth is that Daniel's genius doesn't come in the form of a perfectly crafted album or song. It comes in the palpable energy that he can communicate when performing with and for a group of people. But my hope is that this album will give you a glimpse into that one-of-a-kind Daniel Paquette energy. These days, Daniel focuses on a younger generation, creating children's songs under the moniker Mr. Daniel. Rather than working crowds of drunk 20-somethings into a punk frenzy, he's now focusing that excitable energy on the supple minds of children creating the most adorable hysteria imaginable. In the race to see the sun I'm pulling my chains off I'm wrapping my hands around my wrists And pulling my chains off Don't wanna go Arms around 
arms around my neck and pulling me to heaven. <laughs> well thank you for jumping on here yeah yeah by the way i didn't place that that bass looks like i placed it there on purpose oh well to show it off and it, that actually just happened to be where it was <laughs> this is actually this is kind of cool i got a i'll share this with you i just got a new toy yeah let's see so it. this this is a fretless uh bass guitar that i've had wow. for a long time but I'm, I don't think I've ever used it on the recording, but I got this thing. This is a, called a Picasso. It's a tiny little bow that actually fits into the hole. It's designed for acoustic guitars, like uh -huh. regular guitars, of course, but it slides into the hole, so. Oh, wow. Oh, that's cutting out for some reason. God damn it. Oh, is it? <laughs> yeah, about I, think, I think your uh, microphone settings is like, assuming that that's background noise. Oh, uh, all right. You can, I can hear it for like a second when you start. It sounds really cool. Wow. Anyway, it, I've uh, never seen, um, I mean, I've seen plenty of artists use a violin bow. Yeah. This direction, like fucking Jimmy Page or whatever. Yeah, I used to do that too um, on some of our older stuff, but it got to be a pain. And then I got an Ebo, which is. Yeah, uh, yeah. You probably know, but for those who don't know what it is, it's this little thing. Yep. To, and and uh, I I know what those are, but I've I've never really understood how they work. They they, they send an electric well, current. It, no, it's it's the reverse of a pickup, I think. So the it creates a magnetic field that causes the string to vibrate. Like, huh. uh, can you hear that? Yep. So it's like a, a real bow. It's it's making the string vibrate. Okay. With I think with a magnetic some. So anyway, right, um, but it's it's not right. It's not like transmitting something directly to the pickup. It's actually making the string. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Like this doesn't create sound. Right. And this this was my new toy. You know, ten years ago, mm -hmm. and I used it way too much on whatever record was. It was probably <laughs> this one, I just got this, and we're going cool. to record in a week. And uh, oh god, it's it's going to end up being on the record way more than. <laughs> That's all right. It's good to like play with your new toys on records, right? Like, oh well, yeah, I, I started using this, just messing around with some of our demos, adding that, uh, you know, I'd add um, four or five layers and it's kind of sounds like an orchestra. Oh, that's, that's awesome, really dude. Cool. Having these concepts, like, should I do a whole record of that stuff? I don't know, we'll see. But uh, that's really cool. So yeah, let, I mean, let's, let's talk about that. You've got, two new l1011 records that you've written yeah. and you're about to record yeah yeah after you just released a triple album 
<laughs> I know. I'm an, I'm a maniac. What's the secret to having constant inspiration like that? I don't know. I mean, it just comes right now. The well is flowing over a year from now. It might be empty. I, I, I honestly don't know. I'm a workaholic when it comes to music as evidenced by all these records that I've been putting out side projects and stuff. I just, I enjoy it. It's for me, it's fun. It's really hard for me to find people who can keep up with me. Yeah. Um, in the non pandemic time, it was impossible. I, I tried to start all these side projects, uh, and almost none of them could get off the ground because no one, I'd finish my part of it, <laughs> but whoever I was working right. with, but the pandemic made it so that people were home more. Yeah. Hold them and accountable. The accountability thing is tough because, you know, it's, it's art or it's right. hopeful art. Totally. So you, so, can't, you know, if the guy, I don't know if the person is being flaky and just isn't kind of not into it. So it's like, okay, well, there's that. Or if it's like, well, I don't have any inspiration. I didn't come up with anything. Right. I can't argue with that and be like, well, be inspired and come up with something. I know, man. I mean, I get that even in my work life. Like I have to segment the the types of work that I do. And sometimes I just don't have headspace to, you know, listen to demos or whatever. Yeah. You know? yeah. And, and um I totally get that, man. Uh, it's it's hard to like force your brain to fucking care about this shit when it just doesn't. <laughs> well, I don't know. For me, I've never experienced that, so it's hard to relate. Wow. I'm always ready. I'm always excited, and I'll always come up with something. It might not be it's good. Just a tap you can you can put on, yeah. huh? You know, I didn't knock on wood. I don't want to yeah. jinx anything, but. The, I don't know. I just keep coming up with the ideas and I, I want, I like doing this and I want, I want to, I'm a performer. I want these, I'm not just doing this for myself. I like putting it out to the world. And even if it's not, you know, hugely popular or whatever, I like it just to be in the world so someone else can enjoy yeah. it. How have you seen the pandemic like positively or negatively affecting your music in general? I mean, I heard one positive thing in there. I, in that you've been able to focus on these side projects that otherwise might not have been able to get off the ground. Obviously, there's the negative and not being able to tour off of Tautology, your fucking epic triple <laughs> album. <laughs> I don't know. Is there anything beyond that? What do you, what's your what's your takeaway? I'll, I'll answer that question, but I actually want to turn it around on you and ask you in a minute what you thought when you signed us and I said, yeah, actually it's going to be three records, not one. <laughs> uh, but okay. Uh, yeah. It sucked not being in, able to tour, but in a way I think maybe that was good for us to take a break. Cause we've never really taken a break before. Mm -hmm. We used to tour a lot more than we do now, not, not including the pandemic 10 years ago or whatever. We would tour more, but once the, once we got bigger and, and more popular, this is going to sound weird, but it actually, when you get more popular, you want to slow down. And you don't want to hit the same city as often. Sure. Like, we try not to hit a city more than once a year. Because when you're, you're like, when you're less popular, you're playing to different people every night. You're relying on like yeah, the, usually the, 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 um, the more the fan base of the headlining band or whatever, right? Or, or even if we're headlining ourselves, we're, we're still like, trying to attract people and get to pe people to know the name. And you know, when we come back, it's probably going to be different people because it's, right. it's word is still spreading. But once it's spread enough, if we come too often, then it's kind of the reverse. Like we won't, yeah, we won't sell out that venue. It'll be half full or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so we actually need to kind of slow down a bit. Um, but but it works out okay because once you get bigger, then you are making a little more money, so you don't have to tour quite as much to make the same amount. Yeah, that makes sense. So in the last few years, you know, our tours aren't our tour schedule isn't that crazy. Like if you look at the amount of shows we played in a year, it's like, wow. It's like, well, but look at the dates, you know, we'll do three weeks and then we have a month off and then we do another three weeks and then there's a month off. It's not like we were going six months straight without a break. Right. Anyway. But yeah, anyway, I'm not uh, sure that's healthy for anybody to do. No, in, in fact, my, uh, my drummer in Missing Sons, his day job is playing with this arena band called Ghost. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, they're, I mean, they literally sell. Yeah, they're arena. huge. It, it that's such a weird band too. Just here's a tangent, but like I expected them to sound evil, like Cannibal Corpse or something. And what I heard was like Def Leppard or or something. You oh, know yeah. what I mean? It's like straight yeah. up like hair metal. It's like Kiss meets 
the Misfits or something. Yeah, like yeah. yeah Which not, I'm not a fan of either of those bands, so I can't, yeah. I can't really say anything nice about them. But I respect their pageantry. The pageantry. You got to give it up for all the explosions and the masks. I mean, yeah. they went in full. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. And uh, Hayden, my my friend, who's the the drummer, and he's also the musical di- director. I think he's. I think he said they did 280 dates the year before the Jesus pandemic. Jesus Christ. That's 80. so crazy. He burned out. And he's like, oh. look, man, Who I wouldn't? don't know a drummer anymore. Like, we did our record. We did the Missing Sons record. I'm like, man, we should get a live thing together and play this live. And he said, I'm not sure I'm going to be a drummer anymore. I think I'm done. I have lost my passion for drumming. Oh, man. Wow, man. That's that's rough. And he's so good. <laughs> he's an yeah. unreal. Drummers, like, oh. I think he just needs to lose his passion for that band <laughs> and keep well, drumming. I, <laughs> I, 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 I like Ghost. Missing Sons infinitely more than I like Ghost. <laughs> well, we're, this is a kindred. Anyone watching this is probably in our world and maybe not that world, you know. But uh, you know, it's to each his own. Like that yeah. band, people love them. They're they're a really good. Band. Yeah, yeah, totally. I always find it really fascinating when when there's a sort of counterculture band like that that is mainstream at the same time it just always perplexes me i can't i can't ever pinpoint like what makes these bands accessible to the masses especially young people i could understand someone who's 50 liking it because it reminds them of kiss Mm -hmm. but a teenager i because i kind of was thinking is is rock and roll kind of dead like who listens to rock music anymore like, it seems to me like teenagers would be listening to hip hop, or but it's a ton of young people at yeah, their show. Man. We're really into it. We're like, wow, okay, I was wrong. There's, I think the, it's cyclical, you know. know. The rock music that always broke through to the mainstream in a meaningful way to me always seemed to be the really stripped down version of rock music, you know, like when Nirvana booted Michael Jackson off of the top of the billboard charts or whatever, you know, that's like a moment where it's like, holy fuck, this three piece band is really simple songs, no flair. This is now more popular than the thing with all of the bells and whistles. Same thing with white stripes. I felt like that, that happened to, you know, to a smaller degree, but that's what I feel like in, in popular culture. That's what it seems like to me. Like, that's what rock music is good for. <laughs> it's good for, like, cutting. It's good for making, like, when 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 all the pop music gets too, too much flair, too much fucking frills, like, the rock music will, like, cut it down to size, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because then you start he- hearing elements of what cut it down to size in the pop music. Yeah, right and then then it repeats yes <laughs> <laughs> the cycle just keeps going <laughs> i know <laughs> yeah which is weird to me that's to get back to what we were talking about a second ago i'm just surprised that rock is still here doing that like i understand hip-hop doing it but him hip-hop is so mainstream also you know there's underground hip-hop and then there's super mainstream hip-hop and there's i mean there's freaking rap in country music you know, rapping emerged. There's a like genre convergence happening in the mainstream, which you would think would be cool. But it's, you think it'd be cool, but it's awesome. actually just taking the worst fucking parts of all of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, like it's some fucking bean counter, you know, down in at you know Warner Brothers being like, you know, if we put in a rap part in this country song we can get three million extra streams you know which is what i do when i write songs <laughs> if i use this little picasso i know yeah. i'm gonna sell a thousand more units in yugoslavia so <laughs> i am curious about your process for writing songs given how prolific you are i'm just curious if like how do you normally do it? Do you usually like sit down with a guitar and and come up with sort of the the skeleton? I'll show you. Let me show you. Yeah. So here's what I do. I'll be sitting right here in this chair with this computer and with a bass, possibly this one, and and I'll play something. I'm like, oh, that sounds pretty cool, but I should probably 
Maybe add distortion to it. So I add distortion to it, and my pedals are right there. Then I hit record on the computer, and I record it. And that makes another idea pop into my head. And I'm like, oh, what if there was sort of a keyboard sound going over the top of this? So I fool around with my effects and come up with you know a keyboard sound out of this thing. Like, nope, that doesn't work. And then I add some tremolo to it. I'm like, ooh, that works. That's weird and cool. And then that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's how it starts. That's and great. then once I get it to a point where it's decent, I think I'll send it t to Tim, my drummer, and he won't respond. He doesn't really respond to emails, <laughs> which used to make me feel terrible. But now I just know he doesn't respond. And then eventually I'll say, let's have band practice and let's work on that one. And we get in the room together and start banging it out and trying to figure out what works and what doesn't work. And once yeah. it's far enough along, um, I'll send it now. This is this is kind of new for us in the last few years. I'll send it over to Sonny, who is our producer, and he throws in his two cents about what's working, what's not working. He's the best. Yeah. It, it's like our, as soon as we started working with him, our records got a lot better. So he's really good at identifying what my strengths and my weaknesses, Tim's too. So send it over to him. Or sometimes I'll even just make a demos with fake drums, you know, from Logic or whatever, and send that to both those guys at the same time. It's like, you you guys like this? Are you into this? Is that what you did with, with these new demos? Yeah. That I've heard? Cool. Because, because pandemic, you know, Tim and I weren't getting together that much. So I was just writing and writing and writing and writing and, and sending and sending and sending, sending. And the majority of what I sent, the, the response from, the, from those two was like, wow, that's really good, man. I think you're onto something. Yeah. What if you tried something like this? And then we'd monkey around. And then eventually, you know, we started getting together and pounding it out. That's in awesome. Room. Ha, so that, are you um, uh, classically trained? Do you read and write music? Nah, th that, that muscle has atrophied. Mm -hmm. I, I did, I studied music in college and, um, reading and writing were a part of that and it was really hard for me because you know r reading music is the the math side of the brain it's mm -hmm. not the artist art yeah. side of the brain i forget which is which uh so most people who are really good at reading aren't good at writing and vice versa generally speaking of course there are exceptions and i'm one of those guys who's i can write great I, you can play me something and i'll play it back to you you know that kind of thing but if i have to write it out yeah <sighs> it's like doing homework Oh yeah, it's such a chore. Yeah. Um, uh, when did you start playing music? Uh, well, I started playing bass. I st well, to go way back, I started with clarinet when I was fourth grade. I think fourth grade and fifth grade, I was playing clarinet. I actually really liked it, but uh, the what music is that, were like nine, ten years old or something. Yeah, something like that. Actually. No, it'd be 10 and 11, I think. Okay. Uh, but I didn't, the music we were playing at school in band wasn't the music I was listening to at home, which was rock music. Mm, sure. <laughs> no clarinet and rock music, unfortunately. Yeah. And then I really wanted to play bass. And I was pleading with my dad to rent me a bass. He said, why would I rent you a bass? I, I bought you. He bought me the clarinet, which was probably 200 bucks or something. And he's like, I bought you that and you quit. Why would I rent you a bass? I'm like, no, no, no. This is going to be different. <laughs> you don't you understand. Know? This is the one. It's, yeah. it's some convincing, but here I am. You know, all these. So that that happened in, let's see, I think I was 13-ish, which would be 83 because I'm 51. So I'm, I'm coming up on playing for 40 years. Wow. Um, but anyway, I was about 13 and I just was freaking obsessed. I mean, practicing, practicing. I mean, my parents had to be like, dude, you need to go to bed. You need to do your homework, stop playing bass kind of thing. Wow. I mean, generally they encouraged me, but I didn't I didn't want to play sports. I wanted to play bass. Did things change for you when when you discovered effects pedals and, and looping oh. capabilities? Yeah. When was yeah. that? Because like that that shit didn't exist really in, in 83, right? Oh, no, no, there was no looping pedals. No, yeah. no, I was playing you know, normal bass, playing in bands and stuff. But I was really kind of obsessed with people who would make the bass. Sorry, let me turn that up. Would make bass the lead instrument. Yeah. Like Peter Hook from New Order or the jazz guys like Stanley Clark and Jacko Pastorius, even though I, I wasn't really into their style of music, but their playing was ridiculous. Um, and I went and saw Simple Minds. Let's see, it was Simple Minds opening for The Pretenders. 
in 84, Whoa. five, maybe. Yeah. It was a fucking great show. And, um, I instantly became this huge Simple Minds fan because at that time, what they were doing was really, inv- they're horrible now, but at that time, it was super inventive and the guitar player had a bunch of effects in front of him that he was tiptoeing through during the whole show and making his guitar sound like a keyboard. Mm-hmm. And it, a lot of times you couldn't tell what was the keyboard and what was the guitar. And for whatever reason, that's what just turned me on. I'm like, that is badass. I want to do that. So I begged my parents for an effect pedal <laughs> for Christmas. I think... I got a, a chorus pedal and a delay pedal. And I actually, I still have them. It's these boss, little boss chorus. Mm-hmm. And I started trying to use them, you know, playing in, in my high school band and I was overusing them. You know, I didn't really need them, but I was trying to use them because I thought it was so cool. And that's the way it went for a lot of years. I would be playing in bands, trying to play lead bass with lots of effects in bands that didn't particularly want that. So I was pissing <laughs> off my band a lot until finally L1011. And I, I got to be the lead guy. <laughs> yeah. That's what you needed the whole time. He needed to be the, the lead guy. Yeah. That's cool, man. I did. Uh, I have that lead personality, but I'm playing bass, which is not typically a lead instrument. Right, right. Well, it should be. But it's like if you're thinking about bass in those ways, you know, if you're if you're thinking about it as this vehicle for sound, you know, and not just a not just a bass, not just a traditional instrument, yeah. um, which I think you do, then it's yeah, it becomes just this sort of like perfect conduit to to just like sculpt music out of, you know. It's such a tremendous instrument that really not very many players reach the potential that they could with bass, I don't think. Which actually, in a lot of in a lot of ways, a lot of circumstances, that's appropriate. If you're the bass player right. in Smashing Pumpkins or whatever, you, you need to hold, the, hold it down yeah. while the guitars are doing all that yeah. stuff. So, like how terrible would the Beatles be if they had like a slap bass player, man, you know? Like, I, I think they'd be great. <laughs> I, I don't like the Beatles, so I, I think- You don't like the Beatles? Come on, dude. No, I respect them. I, I respect them. They're great at what they did, but their music just does nothing for me. I, really? what can I say? I'm not trying to be provocative. I, I've tried. I try to listen to their music. Oh, like, it just says to me okay. stupid music. I, I don't get it. I, I know s- several um, several people that I whose music I love and respect who say the same thing, and I don't get it. But um, no, I try. I, I'm not trying to. But don't do tell not- me you're like a Stones guy or a fucking Elvis guy or something. I don't like rock music that's old. Good. Like any rock music before the mid '70s, just does. Yeah. There are exceptions. There are exceptions. But rock music before '75 is to, it's mostly horseshit for me. What what, hate, um, what was the first like the first record that you got into as a kid that really sort of changed your paradigm? The soundtrack for Star Wars. Whoa, that's that's an interesting yeah. one. Huge, it's still a huge one for me. Yeah, wow. Unbelievably influential. What's I his would, name? Fuck, I should know this. John Williams. John Williams, yeah. Yeah. That, um, you know, it's funny, like looking back on it, I, I, I think about L-Town 11 music and our music is it's sort of orchestral and epic sounding, but yet kind of pop at the same time. Yeah. And growing up in my house, now I, 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 this didn't dawn on me until just a couple years ago. My parents would play classical music and they'd play country music. Hmm. Like, ah, that kind of makes sense for what I ended yeah. up doing. Are your um, parents musicians at all or, or interested uh, in music at all? No, uh, my mom, we, we didn't know it, but my mom was a phenomenal artist, a, a painter and a sculptor. Hmm. But she just abandoned that while she had a, her job. Hmm. And she retired and started painting and we couldn't, we're like, whoa, where did that come from? Wow. Uh, and my dad, no, not him. He would admit this. No musical or artistic skill, what, whatever. Yeah. He's the math side of the brain guy. Yeah, yeah. He can count cards in Vegas and make money and all that kind of stuff. So. In my household growing up, there was just no music. Like, it just didn't occur to my parents to even have a stereo, you know? <laughs> so when I discovered it, it was really transformative for me but it but it was something that was that i totally had to do on my own it was not encouraged really at all you know isn't it interesting how far you went like now you're running a record company yeah 
Yeah, maybe it's like I'm still rebelling against my parents <laughs> as a 10 year old or whatever. <laughs> I'll tell you. Oh, ask you a question. Okay, let's change subjects really quick. Ask you a question. So you signed us before we did recorded Tautology. Mm -hmm. I assume you signed us thinking we were going to deliver one record, and then that's usually what what bands do. Yeah, that's what bands do, and then I can't remember if it was me or our, it was probably our manager who said to you, "Yeah, it's actually going to be three records." Were you thinking, "Oh, for Christ's sake, really?" <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, honestly, I, I wasn't Be uh -oh. like, because I'm such a huge fan. I was like, fuck. Yeah. Uh -oh, like, okay. I, I was, I was really excited about hearing that much material, but at the mm -hmm. same time, intellectually, I knew, okay, this is going to be more of a challenge. Yeah. But that's okay. It was a challenge that I was up for. Yeah. Well, you guys nailed it. I mean, that's our best selling record, you know, Thank we you. Made it into the Billboard charts, that we'd sold out the vinyl in a, a day, or I mean, it, yeah, I was, did it, I was you know? psyched about that, man. It. Like, it's always a, you know, you never know. Um, I mean, you know, the the label has, you know, definitely a a batch of devotees, you know, who will buy almost everything we release. But when we sign a new band, it's like you, you never quite know if if the label audience is going to fully be on board yeah. and it seemed like in your case you know with l1011 it was like enthusiastically all the label people were fully on board and a lot of them were already fans and they were just of yours and they were fucking psyched that we're now working together you know right it was kind of an interesting one timeline wise just because we had it all planned out as this really long, long campaign, not realizing that this pandemic would happen, which basically made every other release in the world and also a long campaign, you yeah. know, or a, a lot of them, you know, it dragged everything out. And I think the only way the pandemic sort of negatively influenced it is that you guys weren't able to tour off of it. Yeah, we, um, we, we had the tour book too. Yeah. Fully confirmed and it was going to, be the best tour we'd ever done. It seemed oh like just the offers we were getting and stuff. We're like, wow, we're really kind of popping up a little bit. We're so excited. We're like, man, this is going to be a good one, I think. And then, you know, but we got another tour book that hasn't been announced yet, but it's yeah, coming, you know. I can't wait, man. And you know, I've never actually seen you guys play in front of an audience. I, I've been in the studio with you, you know, I've yeah. like, uh, obviously we work together a lot, but I've never seen you play in front of like at, a, at an actual show, <laughs> oh, <laughs> which, is, which is ridiculous to me because also, and I, I'm not trying to be flattering or hyperbolic here. I legitimately think that Elton 11 is the band I've listened to the most out of any band ever in terms of just actual okay. like listening hours you know um and not e not even just like bands on the label but like just any band because oh. um i find it to be like highly uh therapeutic man <laughs> you know not only am i like a huge fan of your compositions and everything but the positive energy that it gives me is like is really helpful on a day-to-day -day basis <laughs> yeah i'm i'm nodding not because i'm being conceited or anything but other people have said that to me a lot yeah. over the years it's so interesting and i'm grateful and humbled by that and it's just i can't you know i just showed you my you know i just yeah the, the writing of these songs it's it's very private it's very we're just trying to come up with stuff that moves us and the fact that it moves other people and and deeply sometimes is just so gratifying yeah and thank god yeah i mean it's uh well i guess we're all you know lucky that you've sort of stumbled across this <laughs> this way to create this stuff that sounds like it's a necessary release for you <laughs> and it's really therapeutic for others do you feel like instrumental bands um do you have any thoughts about the space in the music industry that mus that instrumental bands occupy right now do you no. do you feel like it's um 
improved in recent years? I have no idea. I really don't. I don't really listen to instrumental bands, to be honest. But just from your perspective of being in one, do you like it seems to me that like that's one of the beneficial byproducts of the streaming economy is that it makes uh, it gives a leg up to instrumental bands because of deep focus playlists and shit like that. Working playlist. Yeah, we've definitely uh, benefited from that for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, And then it makes, you know, we always wonder, well, okay, if people are listening to us to study, that's great. I mean, I'll I'll take the streams and I'm happy we're helping people and stuff. But then we always wonder, is that, does that translate into someone being a fan? Yeah. It it appears that it does uh, uh, often, but I, how often? I I, Mm -hmm. I don't know. I really don't. It's such a weird world. but it's fantastic. I mean, this is, you know, a lot of people complain about Spotify and the music industry. Uh, to me, this is the golden age. This is the best time ever to be a musician. I think Spotify is phenomenal, both as a fan and as a musician who makes money. I think the people who complain about Spotify royalties and stuff are those who aren't really making much money at, at it and they think they should be. Well, I, yeah. Man, it, 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 and we still had the fucking, just, just the label system and you were releasing CDs. How much less would you be I mean, like wh- where do you think you would be right now it's weird right where i see it hurting people the most is artists that are of a certain age or whatever like like they they had released records in the 90s let's say and they had a fan base of a small amount of people like, but they could still count on selling, you know, let's say 2000 copies of, of a record. You could make a very humble living off of that. You know, if you're just selling 2000 copies of a record and you're touring, you know, whatever, six months a year and you're playing to a hundred people a night or 50 people a night or something like there are a lot of good bands that made a living sort of on that level. I'm not saying it's a good living, but it was still, you know, they didn't have to necessarily have a second job. And that level of band doesn't make sense in the new economy. You know, those 2000 sales that they used to have, from my perspective, it seems like that those have shrunk to like 200 because a lot of the people that had bought records will now just stream them. And so they're seeing it as, you know, I used to make this much money per record sale, and now anybody can just stream it for free, basically. Yeah, but there's also the the front end. So now the barrier to entrance is zero. I know. And so the deal, and they would give you money, and you owe that back. So it's like, well, totally. And and I know. And the the other hugely beneficial thing about Spotify or, or you know streaming in general is the fact that all the music in the fucking world is now accessible to all of these people in the remotest regions of the world like places in you know fucking east asia and like africa and like eastern europe and stuff like places that have never had a record store yeah like now all of a sudden those people have access to all the music that's ever been fucking written you know and that's powerful like that's important for like human evolution yeah that's why when i hear people complaining i'm just like i think that there are legitimate complaints and i would i would i would love for spotify to you know start paying bands one cent per stream instead of half a penny per stream you know but bankrupt but i don't think they would man look at their Think, well, they give seventy five percent of the money that comes into the art or to the songwriters, whoever writes it. Yeah, mm-hmm. but I mean, that's not that's a, that seems reasonable. Not unusual. They don't have any overhead costs in terms of making the shit. You know. Uh, well, yeah, because they, they only have technology, they, and they have they, they 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 do make deals though. Like you heard about I Joe Rogan. They're so they do make deals. They do have a front cost. I mean, I don't t- totally understand how Spotify works. Don't get me wrong. They got up front costs when they signed Joe Rogan or whatever. Yeah. But like. There's a lot of deals like that. Yeah, but that's 
it's not a great deal for everybody. That's all I'm saying. Here's what I think it does ultimately. Here's what I fear is that because the the economics of streaming only makes sense if you appeal to this much, much wider audience, right? I fear that that in itself will squeeze out these really unique artists that by by their nature they will they only will ever have a a really narrow audience you know artists like like daniel johnston you know or jad fair or someone i'm not sure that those artists would ever be able to exist in the streaming world or even the melvins and those artists went on to influence like nirvana you know and so like what what the fuck is music going to look like 20 years from now and it is the streaming economy going to like create shittier art like that's what i'm worried about uh, i think i think you have it backwards i think that that paradigm is gone now and it was great sometimes but now there'll be some kid in, from indianapolis who puts something up online that catches on that we all get super influenced by and it's really good yeah but all those kids are like not they're not writing in silos. Like a lot of them are trying to write music that will be popular on Spotify. You know, yeah, they're trying to crack the algorithm. The same thing in that label system that you seem to yeah, love yeah. so much. They were doing the same thing. There's always going to be people who just want success. They want to be famous. That's always going to exist, whatever the medium. But now anybody can make a record, which is fantastic. Yeah, it there's is. too many records coming out. But when I was 16, if I could have made a record, oh my God, that would have been mine. When I was 26 if i could i mean i'm old enough to remember when you had to have a record deal which sucked yeah like l10 and 11 never would have gotten off the ground in that system i mean i've had freaking 13 14 record deals in my life mm. major label ones too nothing I, nothing ever happened never made money no, nothing what you just described being able to tour no not, none of that now in this new system i'm actually able to have a, this place yeah or music, you know, it's that's great to hear. I, I, I say good riddance to that old system. Yeah, there was some great art that came from it, but adios. And, and you know, I, I'm I'm mostly I mostly agree with you from our label's perspective. We were never a part of that earlier system. We started growing after the collapse of the music industry, yeah. and we never made a fucking dime off of downloads. So, like when streaming started, we were like, oh. You mean free money for the thing that people are already pirating? Sure, you know? <laughs> and then five years later now or whatever, streaming makes up a good chunk of the money that we operate on. Yeah, yeah, we figured it out. I'm not trying to, I'm not complaining. I just, I, I worry about the type of art that's getting squeezed out due to the Well, I think we're in a way better place for art now than we were in the- I think you know, overall, right. you're probably right. You're probably right. I'm always uh, right. I'm always right. <laughs> no, but it is pretty um, ballsy for you guys. Have to, you guys started the label in 2010? Was it? Um, well, it's 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 hard to say because I I started the label by creating a fake label name to put on the back of my band's CD when I was a <laughs> freshman in college. You know, okay. in 2003 just to that like fake hard. fake a sense of legitimacy or whatever yeah right yeah. yeah i like made a you know joyful noise to put on there just to it wasn't a real label at all right um and it That's sort of slowly true. became a thing where i was like releasing my friends bands records and then it very sort of organically grew into um into a real label i would say i would say it became a real label around around 2010 I remember I went full time with I like I quit my day job and shit in uh, 2011. So oh, that's pretty quick. Well, not from tw 2003 to 2011. <laughs> well, if, I mean 2010. If 2010 yeah, was yeah. first kind of like, like legit released or whatever, and then a year later you don't have a day job anymore, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Well, it was. I felt like I didn't have a choice, man. You know, it was the kind of thing where it was like, I can put all my energy into this and maybe make it successful and go for it. But if I keep 
just moonlighting, if I keep just having it be the, the secondary priority, then it'll never be successful. Right. So I, I felt like I just had to sort of like rip the fucking bandaid off. And it was, you know, it's, I struggled financially for a little while, for sure, you know, but, but, you know, wouldn't have it any other way, man. I can't fucking believe my luck. <laughs> well, it's not just luck. I mean, there's luck involved, but it's, I wouldn't say you're lucky. I'd say you're fortunate. Like you, mm. you were, you're talented and you did something that people like and respect and want. So it's not like you just were walking down the street and like, oh, look, there's a hundred dollar bill. Right, right. You built this thing. <laughs> and you work yeah. with great art. <sighs> I, yeah. I mean, that's the, that's one of the, the weird counterintuitive things that I've lucked into with the label is that I have never given a fuck about the popularity of a band or their ability to make money. Like that is a very secondary focus to me. That is how I try to determine the scope of a release. But that's not how I determine whether or not we work with an artist, whether or not we release their music. Right. And I think that's that's where most labels get it wrong is they they chase the success or they chase the potential for success or money. And it's like what I chase is good art, you know, and then mm-hmm. hope that money will follow. <laughs> yeah. And luckily, usually it does. Talking about record labels for many years before we worked together, you released your own albums under fake record label moniker. <laughs> I guess I'm just curious, do you miss that at all? Did you like doing the label side or? No. I mean, if I- It was only out of necessity that you were doing it, basically? I always wish that we had someone to help us. Mm -hmm. I mean, don't get me wrong. If if I wasn't a musician full-time, my second choice for career would be working at a label, uh, which I did for a while, actually, in the early early aughts, I guess you would say. Oh, yeah? Where? Uh, Yeah, that was great. That was really- that's a job that I wish every musician could have for a while because I learned so much about the label side of things, mm-hmm. including that artists can be a freaking pain in the ass sometimes, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> All the stories about how horrible record labels are have been told again and again and again, and they're, and they're true. I mean, there's a lot of horror stories that are true and sh- shameful, but there's some pretty nasty artist stories too that we never hear because artists can i'm sure you've got some of your own uh you know that was eye-opening to me by and large we've been very lucky to to work with really good people but we we have a very strict no dicks policy (laughs) then how did you sign me (laughs) slip through the cracks i guess Yeah. yeah um a truism that i've realized is that all artists are crazy and usually the better they are, the crazier they are. And you just have to learn how to deal with them, how to, how to, how to be like a, a conduit of their art. You're, you're kind of like a, like an ambassador, you know, between that artist's vision and the world, you know, and you just have to try to meet them where they are. Well, I think, I discovered when I had that job again, now this is 20 years ago. So the landscape may be what, different. What job was it? Was it a major? Uh, no, it was, uh, it was called ultimatum music, which you wouldn't have heard of, but we did assign Jay Mascus actually. Oh, really? Yeah. That was kind of the only cool. Well, there was, there were two. So it was a subsidiary of William Morris, the agency uh-huh. Not subsidiary. It was, uh, it was, started by people from there and then they abandoned it fairly quickly um signing all kinds of different acts one of which was jay mascus which that was a really cool record jay mascus yeah. oh yeah dude no I, I listened to that record uh there were two of them right i used to yeah. listen to those all the time it's good in fact now that we talked about it, i'm gonna bring it up again and listen dude uh, yeah. and then the band that i ended up be playing in which was really weird this band called the incredible moses leroy i was the bass player but i was also working in the a r department so i was doing both sides wow but the the artists had legitimate complaints about the label and the label had legitimate complaints about the artists and i was in the middle kind of being the referee it was really weird yeah um but what you said about artists kind of all being crazy from my perspective 
present company accepted pretty much all record company people are bonkers too yeah like, <laughs> not all there, there are some insane cool people but a lot of people in the record business are freaking nuts weird people yeah so i think maybe it's just the the arts generally attracts yeah. I don't know. I don't know what it is. I think I think that's okay, you know, because like if yeah. well, it, if you're going to be anywhere in the music industry, like you you better not be able to do anything else. Like I mean, you better your heart better be in it to an extent where you fucking can't do anything else and live with yourself because there's way better ways to make money in this fucking world. Just go be a fucking investment banker or something right. like if you're going to be in the music industry, you better give a shit. And I think, yeah, that probably attracts some really crazy people. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's listen to a song, man. Okay. What would you like to play first? Would you like to play L1011 or one of your side projects that you have created during this pandemic? Let's do uh, missing sons. I'm just, let's do right. missing sons. All right. So tell me about this track. Well, tell me about the band. First of all, you guys just released your debut record through our um, gray area cassette series. Yeah. This is, tell me about your bandmate here. This is, uh, what's his name? Dude from Ghost. I forget his name. Yeah, Aiden Scott, who's yeah. a phenomenal Aiden. drummer. He's played, speaking of A-list, <laughs> he yeah. plays with A-list bands like, like Ghost and AWOL Nation and Paramore and real rock kind of stuff. That, but he's... The music he listens to is not really that. He's more into our world kind of arty stuff. But that's how he makes his living because he's so freaking good. But anyway, the way Hayden and I met is we were, L1011 was rehearsing at a rehearsal studio in Hollywood that doesn't exist anymore called Cole. So we were rehearsing there. Hayden was working there and he figured out who we were and he was a fan. And so we just kind of became friends. And then eventually I opened my own rehearsal studio in LA and Cole had shut down. So I hired him to work for me. And then we became really good friends because he was working for me. And, uh, but then he started his drumming career took off and off he went. Uh, but we had always said, we should do something together. We should do a side project together. And this song that uh, you're going to play, which is called everybody. He sent that to me. He sent a, the demo version of that to me, God, in 2013 or something. It's that wow. old. Wow. Dude, this is so good. He's, he said, really? I'm, oh my God, dude, this is so good. We need to do this. We need to finish this song and write a few more and release a record. He's like, yeah, great. Except I, I got to go on tour. <laughs> okay. So that happened. That same conversation happened once or twice a year for the next seven years <laughs> <laughs> jesus like, oh are we ever gonna do this and then the pandemic you know and yeah. then into the pandemic he finally stopped touring and he would send me drum tracks and i would come up up with stuff and we just started writing 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 and we banged out that record we wrote recorded and released that record in two months or something oh, um, yeah. it, it was fast uh so anyway that, that's the story of missing sons that's awesome so you can thank the pandemic for this record. Yep. Yep. Thank you, pandemic.
All right. Such a good song, man. Thank you. Yeah, I was blown away by by this album. First time I heard it. Thanks. I'm still just amazed at your um, your ability to write a triple album for for L1011 and that whole record in you know a span of what twelve months. Yeah. You're lucky you got. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's. it's I don't know, man. You, you're you're lucky you got that gene, whatever that is, um, because it, it seems am, like it's just fucking pouring out of you. I'm lucky too that um, I don't have to have a day job. I mean, most of my yeah career, I had to have a day job too. I just didn't make enough money on it, and it, it really part of being able to write this much material is having the time to do it. Mm-hmm. Like in the middle of a Tuesday, you know. I, one o'clock in the afternoon, I could be writing instead of being at some job. Where, yeah. You know. Do you find that it's, is it helpful for you to like clock in, like have normal hours for yourself? No, no, no. I don't need that. Uh, some, I think some people need that mm-hmm. to stay motivated, but I'm so motivated. If anything, it's, it's kind of the reverse. It's like, I, I just constantly want to be writing and I realize I, I, you know, I need to pick up my daughter at school or no, not that that's a bad thing, yeah, yeah. but <laughs> Um, no, I, I don't need that at all. For me, it's fun. That's the thing is that I, mm-hmm. I think for some people writing, it's kind of a chore. For me, yeah. it's not, or I they have really like fun. a lot of people have anxiety around it. I think yeah. like they worry that what they're writing isn't good enough or something. If anything, uh, I have a problem in that I'm too much of the opposite that I'm, I'm too quick to release things when sometimes, you know, there's, there's stuff I've released in my life where I think, yeah. And maybe that wasn't quite ready. <laughs> maybe that shouldn't have gone out. But so I, I'm the opposite of what you just described. I'm like, boom, that's done. Let's go. Throw that one out. Let's get to the next one. You know, let's yeah. go. Let's go. I think that's a better way to be overall. You know, I mean, you can never predict how art is going to age, you know, how art's going to mm-hmm. be perceived in the future. You know, it's right. it's best to just be honest with how you're doing it at, in the moment. Get it the fuck out there. And then move on, I think. Yeah, I mean, unless you're not happy with it. Yeah, no, of course. Like, you need to be able to stand behind it in the moment. But that's all you have is that that moment. You can't predict what it'll look like 10 years from now. No. I think that's where a lot of artists get hung up is, like, worrying how, it, how it'll be perceived. Probably, yeah, I think that's true. I think there's also the loss of perspective because when you're in it, you, you can't see the trees. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because you can't see the yeah. forest because there's so many trees or whatever um and that's why i love having a producer so much because yeah dude having so many of them i think that's so important to have that outside person that understands your vision like it, it can help you realize your vision better than you knew you could realize your vision you know that's that's the key part right there because Someone like a, say a manager or whatever might say, eh, I, don't, I don't think this is strong enough to release. And then as the artist, you're like, okay, well, well why? I mean, what's wrong with it? What, what should, not that I'm disagreeing with you, but what should I do? Mm-hmm. And the manager is going to say, uh, I don't know. Cause they're not, the manager isn't an, an artist. Right. Whereas if you have a producer, you can very specifically be like, well, this song, the tempo is wrong. And then the uh, snare pattern isn't, right for the song it should be halftime and then your bass part is too busy you know et cetera et cetera et cetera, yeah. et cetera. And like oh oh okay yeah. like, and listen to this song by this artist and this song by that artist and see the vibe they went for there i think you could do that but mix it with this and like oh yeah and then that's what happens with sunny with yeah. us and i'll makes these suggestions i'm like oh yeah yeah, yeah. then i get all excited and i, I want to start working more whereas before we had him i would be like god i don't i mean it's i think i like it i think it's good I've just heard it too many times and uh, oh, we have this tour coming up and we got to have a new release before the tour. So well, yeah, let's put it out. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Sonny seems like such a perfect partner for you guys. Yeah. I got to be a, a bit of a fly on the wall in, in your last studio time. You guys are recording up there in this insane studio, like from a converted historic home, like right on the, Pacific Ocean. Yeah. And, but I could tell just in my brief moment there, I could tell that like you guys have this really amazing 
sort of creative shorthand between you mm-hmm. where you guys can can sort of get to the the heart of what you're trying to do uh, in a in a uh, collaborative way you know i've got a few questions from our jnr 100 people these oh. are these are our label super fans jeremy asks what is the most difficult aspect of live looping well <laughs> that question answered itself live looping is the hardest part of live looping uh for me it's um being accurate with the loop so when you know for those who don't know when you i'm, I'm i keep looking over here because my my looping pedals are right there <laughs> like, let's see them um there all right so when you when i when i step on the pedal it starts recording and then when i step on it again it stops recording and immediately plays back what i just recorded okay for those who don't know what looping is um and then i can overdub on top of that uh the hardest part actually some of these tautology ones are here's what's going to be hard about it i, I think i, I kind of have to show you so on uh see this pedal over here i have to be press, pressing that pedal up and down with my right foot to make it work and then with my left foot um start a loop so i'm playing with both my hands and both my feet are using pedals and i'm not in a chair so i have to balance <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it's so the hardest great. part is balancing on your heels. Yeah. <laughs> right now, that's the hardest part. What it used to be, and well, it still is, um, is timing. Yeah. Because if my loops aren't really yeah. freaking accurate, yeah, man, it Tim gets so off hard. and everything. Like what? Everything gets off, and it's it sounds. Do you so bad. in those, um, in those moments? Do you usually just try to try to redo the loop? Or, or do you do you power through? Does it or it depends. depends on the, so the severity of both. the time. Happy, there's been times when we would have such a train wreck that I would just stop the song and start over again. And interesting, people, people were audiences were really actually kind of into that because yeah. it was so awesome. Yeah, you can see the see the guts. Yeah. Yeah, and then but we've gotten we've been doing this for so long that now I think our mistakes, generally speaking, aren't that noticeable. And we, we kind of work around them. Yeah, and a little smoke and mirrors so uh-huh. people don't. <laughs> um, but even you know, my friends early on told me they're like, "Dude, we like it when you make mistakes because you're watching the guy walk across a tightrope." You know, right? And that's just true. That's, that's a really good uh, analogy. Oh, and then it's <laughs> that's a good analogy. In the interest of humor, what's the worst gig with which you have ever been associated? ever been associated well that's so is, is let's that, just say whatever you what it, what's the worst gig you played personally or in l1011 i wonder well I'll, okay i'll give you one each one was um i played a gig with a violin player and a drummer in yukaipa california in a restaurant and i didn't know the material and the violin player told me it would be okay but then when we got there he looked at me and said you don't know the material and i said no you said it was okay i thought we we're going to be improvising he's like no you need to know these songs I'm like, all right so we just try to get through the set there's hardly anybody there but an old man took his chair pulled it up to the front of the stage and sat on it backwards and just went like this <laughs> the whole time <laughs> <laughs> that was the worst one. Oh uh, man! I think that was my f- worst gig of my life. And then wow. with L Eleven, we've had a few really horrible ones. One that that pops into my head is we played a festival in New Jersey, and it was some hippie fest. And we're not a hippie band, but you know we do these festivals sometimes. And sometimes it goes over really well. There's just a sea of hula hoops and dreadlocks bouncing up to our music, and it's great. It works well. Other times. The hippies are looking at us like, what are you doing? Where's the guitar solo? Um, but this one, I think it was a, a weekend long festival and we got there at the, and we were playing on Sunday. So it was the last day. And uh, it was like the end of the earth had happened. All these hippies were really muddy and dirty. And it was 
really gross. Like they were all camping there and stuff and it was the end and everybody smelled bad and, but people were very nice and they took us to our, our stage and there was a local band, I think, playing and kind of killing it. There was a crowd, you know, bouncing up and down for them. We thought, all right, you know, this, this, this will be all right, actually. Maybe this will be cool. So they finish, get their stuff off. The crowd clears out. We get our stuff on and we play and we play to two people. <laughs> I'm not exactly two. Uh, so it was like, okay, well, what year was this? We're getting paid well, so who cares? So, right. So we finish our set and the two people. <laughs> yeah. Like, all right, whatever, who cares? It's a festival. The money's good. So that we'll, we'll just have that be what makes us happy. So we pack out our stuff. And, oh, and then after us was, it wasn't Medeski, Martin and Wood, but it was one of those guys like Medeski, I don't know, had a band and they played the same thing, you know, like five people watching. It was a train wreck. Wow. So we go to get paid and uh, the guy writes us a check. Okay, thanks. And we go. And of course the check was rubber and it bounced. Uh. So not only did we have a terrible gig, but we didn't get paid. But then the, the good thing is um, about a year later or something, my agent called me up and he's like, guess what? I'm like what? He's like, I got you that money from the, that festival. I'm like, what, what happened? He said, okay, the, the, the promoter or the talent buyer or whatever for that festival was completely blacklisted from all agencies and stuff. Right. And then, and he disappeared. He wasn't responding to emails or anything. And then a year later, he just emails into the agency. Yay. We're trying to buy some acts for our festival. Like, like people would just forget. Yeah. What? I, <laughs> we know we were talking about how there's crazy people in the industry. Uh yeah yes. that's an yeah. example of one yeah <clears throat> so, he, so he, did, he tried to just play it off as though he didn't do anything wrong and then yeah, like, they won't remember me yeah like, and then your agent was like uh give us the fucking money dude yeah it was it was thousands of dollars it's like dude <laughs> like we're just like oh well i forgot about that anyway so there's the two words he actually paid up that's the real miracle he did. yeah so we finally got it uh fuck festivals man that's my official yeah, position great. that one was bad but festivals can be great i yeah. i hate 99 percent of festivals <laughs> just not my not um, not my preferred way to see any music or interact with any people well the problem with festivals now is there's just too many freaking artists like you look at the the lineup; it's just paid. It's just all oh, da, 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 all these artists you never heard of. I remember going to Lollapalooza, Lollapalooza when it was a tour way back, and there was just the main stage and the seven acts. That's it. Not even one side stage. It was just the seven artists. And that right. was it, dude. That's cool. That's enough. Or maybe one yeah. side stage. Like seven bands is a. I would say fucking four bands is the max probably but it's a lot of music i mean i know that's and that's my main issue with festivals it's like it doesn't matter if it's my favorite fucking band in the world playing up there after like three hours of sitting in the hot sun and drinking fucking 20 dollar pbr or whatever like it's i'm not going to enjoy anything yeah not to mention that the sound quality is just the fucking worst the only festival that i actually enjoy is in Utrecht, Netherlands. It's called Le Guess Who, and I go there most years. I will fly to the fucking Netherlands to see this festival. And that's, but that's because it's, it's expertly curated with bands that most of whom I don't know who they are. And they come from like all corners of the globe and they're, and they're all amazing. And they're playing in various sized actual rooms with actual sound systems, you know, not just blasting you know, audio frequencies into a fucking cornfield. <laughs> Sorry, I'm off on a tangent there. It's the opposite. It's, that's, it's interesting. Maybe because I've played and been to so many festivals, I prefer sound outside than in a... Really? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, man. Or you know, like an amphitheater or something. Sound. I think it's... sound in venues, you have to, you're dealing with the walls, and some venues are rough. You yeah, know, but if they have it dialed in... Like it's, even if they have it dialed in, there's just only so much you can do. Like I live here in San Diego, where the San Diego sports arena is notorious for how crappy it sounds. 
Um, but outside there's no, it's just the pure sound. Like you don't have to worry about walls or anything. So, I mean, unless the, the sound person is blowing it, you're, you're just hearing the, the sound itself with no reverberation, which to me is, it's great because it's pure. So I, I would actually pick an outside show over an indoor one. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like I, I have the, the opposite experience. All right. One more question. Um, Patrick Long says, what is the musical instrument that you lost, sold, or otherwise got rid of that you wish you still had? Oh, every one I've sold, really. Mm-hmm. Um, the one I think I regret the most is my very first bass. It was a Fender Bullet bass, which is a small scale, smaller bass because I was small. Uh, and it turns out they're actually really valuable now. They, it was cheap at the time, mm-hmm. probably 200 bucks or something. And now they're worth more than 2000 and I went online, you know, on eBay and I found my base, not the exact one, but the, the same model, same. It was, a, I remember it was a sunburst with a white pick guard. And I wish I would have hung on to that one. Um, not, not just because it's, it's actually worth money now, but cause I just, it's just be cool to have my first base. And it actually, they, they kind of sound cool in a really messed up way. Yeah. So I think that's the number one, one that I wish I still had. Yeah. Yeah. get it let's uh play a song from your other new side project hmm. arguing with hurricanes tell us how this uh how this project came about oh man how am i gonna this is a long story okay i was living here in san diego a, f- a friend of mine and i decided to go to la in his van just for fun just to hang out and go to some cool bars. And then we were just going to sleep in the back of his van. And we got up there and we started the Viper room, not really, not really knowing where to go or what to do. So we had a couple of drinks there like, yeah, this is all right. But why don't we go to the, go to Spaceland? We'd heard that Spaceland was a cool club. Mm -hmm. So we'd been drinking, so we weren't going to drive anymore. So we caught a cab. This is, you know, this is back in 98 or something. So there's no Uber or anything. You have to get a taxi. So we got a taxi. We said, do you know where Spaceland is? And the guy's like, oh, I think so. I think that's out in Silver Lake. I said, great. So he started driving. He's like, uh, just so you know, guys, I just got to pull over and pick up a friend real quick and give her a ride. <laughs> Wait, what? Son. That seems super sketchy. Yeah. We both looked at each other. Like, he's like, no, no, no. It's not going to take any longer. It's not going to cost you any more money. She's just right up here. And um, <laughs> so we pull over. And this young woman jumps in and is sitting in the front seat, right? Uh, hi. <laughs> but then we started talking and she ended up being super freaking cool. And we started talking about music and it turns out she's a singer. Our conversation went all over the place. We were talking about physics, movies, music. We get to Spaceland and we are about to jump out. And we said, turned out her name uh, was, well, Zia. And we said, come with us. Come, like we're gentlemen, we're not, you know, but just come hang out with us so we can keep talking more. And uh, she wasn't sure if she should or not. Cause you know, it's just two guys she met in a taxi cab. Anyway, she, she did jump out and hung out with us. We had a great night. She actually allowed us to stay at her place instead of sleeping in the back of the van. You know, we just slept on couches, not with her. And the next morning we went and got breakfast together. And it turned out she had a publishing deal with Chrysalis, which is a big deal. Um, she was a singer and I was telling her about my adventures, you know, having a deal with Atlantic and the rock band I was in at the time we became friends. And then that led to us playing together and things started to take off really fast. This is the second show we ever played. Um, Ron fair was there. He's the A&R guy who signed like Dave Matthews and Christina Aguilar and all these huge artists. He was at the time he was, uh, A&R for RCA and our second show we ever played, he was there and he lost his mind. Like he came to the dressing room. He was like, you guys are off the hook. You're, this is amazing. And at, I remember at the time, I didn't know what off the hook meant. I'd never heard that before. <laughs> like, I think this is a compliment. You had to learn that. Anyway, uh, he's, like, he's like, what do you guys have on wax? I'm like, what? What's wax? <laughs> what do we have on recorded? I'm like, oh, nothing. This is our second show we've ever played. He's like, you got to, can we have a meeting tomorrow? Can you come to my office tomorrow? I'm like, sure. So. Z and I went to his office the next day in Beverly Hills or wherever it was. And he's, he's, he wanted to sign us. He's like, this is so good. You know, you're, 
talking to you, he said, you're an unbelievable singer. You're, I can't remember who, who he, oh, I remember he compared us to Joni Mitchell and Jocko Pastorius. He's like, you're, he pointed to me, he's like, you're the Jocko Pastorius of the 21st century. This is going to be amazing, blah, blah, blah. And we're, we're excited. Okay, cool. He's like, but you guys don't have anything recorded. We got to record a demo because I, if, if we're, I'm going to sign you guys, my president is going to have to sign off on this. You know, they're going to end up spending a million dollars. So they're going to want to hear something before they're, they're going to say yes. So we need to record a demo. We're like, we'll give you 10 grand to go record a demo. I'm like, okay. So eventually they sent us the contract and it was kind of not a good contract. It was essentially said that if it didn't work out, that RCA still owned the songs. <laughs> so we're like, dude, we're not signing this. Come on. Uh, so the whole thing kind of fell apart. And then... Oh, they still uh, own the demos? Like, they own the they written own material. The they would own the songs themselves, not yeah. the recording. Jeez. Yeah. So we couldn't go re-record the song for a different label. Right. They would own the song. Even so, if, of course... Even if they fine. said they don't want to work with you. Yeah. Fuck that. Yeah, exactly. Fuck that. So we were like, see ya. I mean, it was too bad because we, you know, who knows? Maybe it would have been good if it worked out. Anyway, Zia, in the me meantime, married a man and had a baby with a man who turned out to be very abusive, hmm. physically abusive. And Zia decided in order to keep her child safe, she took her child who was, you know, one year old and in the middle of the night just took off and disappeared. And she, yeah, she was gone for 10 years. And then I, I found out later she was all over the world. She was in England and India and Australia. Wow. She'd settled in Australia with a fake name. And uh, her child grew up there. And, and then the husband eventually found them and actually forgave her for running off with the kid. I mean, she, there, was, there were warrants out for her arrest for kidnapping, even though she was fleeing an abusive guy. Yes. Uh, he so the charges were dropped. She moved with her kid back to Norway, where she's originally from. He moved there too, so he could be near the kid. Although he he only had you know supervised visits once in a while, and then he died. He had a heart attack and died. <laughs> Good. So right. bonkers story, and this is the short version. But anyway, she reached out to me after she'd come out of hiding, and she was living in Norway. Hooray! Uh, and we said wow, we should, we should pick up where we left off and write music together and put it out. And here it is. <laughs> <laughs> that's so fucked up, dude. It's so and that's the short version I've, of the story. I've never heard that full story before. Um, yeah. That's incredible, man. It's bonkers. All right. So here's the track, Cowboy.
Man, you've been busy this pandemic. I'm glad you didn't uh, just do like everyone else and, you know, watch the same Netflix show 20 times in a row. I'm glad we can fucking help you get this shit out there, too. Me, too. I got one more question before <laughs> before we uh, listen to the last song. You live in San Diego, and there's been a lot of, like, a lot of news about the UFO, UAP oh, yeah, yeah. happening right now. And like mm-hmm. how, you know, I mean, the, the Pentagon is admitted they have no fucking idea of what these things are. And a lot of them are happening right off the coast of San Diego. I'm curious if what your thoughts are on that. If you've ever, have you ever seen I'm, a UFO? No, I haven't. Um, have you looked into it at all? Yeah, I kind of rabbit hold on that. Like I, I listened to that podcast with Commander Fravor yeah. on Joe Rogan. Yeah. Fascinating. That's the kind of thing that I really enjoy because someone like him and the guy uh, he had on who used to be in the State Department, whose name I can't I can't quite uh, remember. Elizondo, I think. These guys are as credible as credible comes. Right. This is a commander of an F-18 squadron. He's an F-18 pilot. So, you know, when somebody like that says, look, I saw this thing, I don't know what it is. Yeah. It was defying the laws of physics. I'm not, you know, he does not come off as a crazy person at all. Right. Um, then it, it's just, there's just so much more believability there than yeah. some person who maybe really did see something who was, you know, I was yeah. fishing. And this it's thing. not just flew him over. either that day. I mean, he had his, his uh, co-pilot or whatever, like behind him, you know, and, and then there's all the radar data. Like there's obviously something. You see when um, Neil deGrasse Tyson was on Joe Rogan, he was really skeptical about it. Yeah. And I was like, dude, I'm skeptical of your skepticism. I know, right? All this dude, gear. Be- before this, this, I was I was all about Neil deGrasse Tyson, but like, dude, like, what are you afraid of? Why are you rejecting actual evidence you know yeah so fucked up like i i lost a lot of respect for him it was uh i was i was surprised joe reagan wasn't a little harder on him um because yeah. you've got two f-18 pilots and two f-18s with two weapons officers so four officers in the navy in the highest one of the highest tech jets that exists seeing this thing both with their naked eye on a clear day and with all their radar equipment and it was actively jamming their radar not to mention infrared and all the other systems and then all the systems on the ship were seeing the same things that's why they flew out there is because the the ship was seeing things with their equipment and neil degrasse and tyson was saying well you know it was probably some kind of a glitch in the equipment i'm like a glitch in all of that in their brains like, come on like they uh, saw it with their fucking eyes yeah you, it, it, sorry uh, like it doesn't mean it's ufos it could be I know, like, totally it could be i don't know what it is yeah. okay but i'm not trying to or no it does mean it's ufos it doesn't mean it's alien exactly it's okay. it's an unidentified flying object yeah. literally but that doesn't mean there's little aliens flying no. out and it could be a pro saying that, be, or like no off. one I'm not, saying that. but what I am saying is like, there is something there and we don't know what the fuck it is. And that's weird and frightening. Weird. I don't have a, any, uh, a, a different perspective on it. Cause I'm here in San Diego or anything. I, I mean, there's, yeah. that happened pretty far out. Um, they were a few miles out to see from here. I, I think when that happened. Yeah. that. Uh, but like, um, based on what I've, uh red it it seems like like that's a a hot spot like that wasn't uh just a a fluke you know maybe that's why i've been so creative lately it's the aliens aliens ah (laughs) (laughs) oh and you might know more about this than me fravor as part of his story they had chased the tic tac right and Mm -hmm. it had like zipped off like disappeared at like impossible speeds and then his 
person back at the aircraft carrier or whatever said, you're not going to believe this, but it's back and it's where it's currently located in your your future coordinates. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know the, the um, military lingo for this, but basically like Fravor didn't know where he was going to go next. Mm-hmm. Right. No one knew where they're going to like direct him next. Mm-hmm. But before they n- knew that, the fucking thing was already there. That's really spooky. Which is insane. Yeah. yeah. That like that implies like some time travel element <laughs> of all of this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or some. Well, yeah, man. I don't know. <laughs> I don't if, know. And I mean. <sighs> If you're talking about like impossible speeds, you're talking about time travel also. Oh yeah, because time yeah. Yeah, relativity. If you get fast right. enough, you like time. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So yeah. Wow. <laughs> I mean I don't know. <laughs> I know how crazy it is. Uh, yeah. It's fucking crazy, dude. And uh it's it's so weird that no one is freaking out. That's the interesting part is there's so many of us going, go, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but nobody's, that was part of the reason I thought it turns out this isn't true, but why, uh, what a lot of conspiracy theorist type people were saying, the reason the, the government is trying to cover this up is because there'll be worldwide panic. It, it turns out that actually that's probably not true is because they, they thought that, um, we would misinterpret it as, as uh, Soviet technology and the Soviets were pulling ahead in the Cold War. But um, that panic has just not come, no. and uh, which is good. I don't know if there's there's any other reaction to have other than just like, oh, fuck, okay. I guess, I guess there are aliens. Let's just keep going to work, you know? Well, we're kind of helpless. I mean, if... Yeah, well, like what else are you going to do, right? It would be nice, though, if aliens were watching over us and keeping us from just obliterating ourselves. Yeah, I mean, that would be All nice. started around, there, you know, in the 40s when we are There is a, a strong connection between UFO sightings and, and nuclear yeah. uh, bases, you know? I mean, e- even like Roswell, dude. Yeah. That is the site of the first atomic bomb testing testing area you know i mean that's not an accident i don't think you know either it's it's fucking us going insane because of the shit that that we're poisoning ourselves with or there's some other entity that is trying to save us from ourselves and maybe that's just us from the future (laughs) i always wondered about that too especially the the people who report having been abducted and actually seeing aliens yeah. and stuff I'm like hey, is that just us from thousands of years in the future yeah. or something <laughs> anyway all right so uh let's uh end on this this last track from the new l1011 record tautology and this this song half mast is there any um any story behind this track um this one there's what sounds like a lot of keyboards on there and there's no keyboards. It's all me using these pedals and making my bass sound like a keyboard playing a fretless bass with that keyboard sound. I was able to do this like sliding keyboard sound that got me really excited. You, you asked earlier what my writing process is. And I think it was fooling around with my pedals and finding that keyboard sound while using a fretless bass. So I was sliding a keyboard sound around. I'm like, wow, that's cool. I've never, heard that before even from an actual keyboard player I don't think and so I think if I remember right I think on this one the sound came first you know playing my bass and hearing that sound come out was startling and I just like wow okay I gotta do something with that because I love it it. yeah and then this this song came out somehow from that (laughs) (laughs) that's awesome all right well here it is half mass thanks so much dude Really appreciate you uh, you. doing this. Ta.
Thanks for listening to the Joyful Noise Radio Hour.